Hey, Mushroom Nerds, Anna McHugh here. I wanna to talk to you about this little devil here. So this is the ringless honey mushroom. It is an edible and very common mushroom in uh, the Southeastern United States. The Latin name for this is uh, Desarmillaria cespitosa. And that is the Latin name designated, you know, assigned to it as of April, 2021. Um, so you will see this mushroom listed as Armillaria tabescens almost anywhere you go. Uh, but, you know, as of uh, April of this, this uh, year, 2021, uh, it was determined that both genetically and microscopically, this species is different from Armillaria tabescens, which is a European only species. You see this very, very commonly in mycology. You'll have uh, North American species that look similar, that from an edibility perspective is identical, um, that, you know, people will discover is in fact different. And, you know, when I try to remind people that on a uh, sort of evolutionary scale, there's a lot of opportunities for fungi to have uh, divergently evolved because they're very ancient organisms. So you have, you know, very, very uh, long-standing relationships with specific hosts. You'll see that with fungi very frequently. Uh, you'll see species that look and, and behave very similarly that are genetically distinct. All kinds of indications, again, of the uh, length of time that these uh, organisms have had to adapt and also potentially their adaptability in general because fungi are, um, you know, super inclined to figure out pretty innovative ways of staying alive. So all that by way of saying uh, Desarmillaria cespitosa is a uh, mushroom that clusters and you'll find it usually at the um, base of trees or at the base of places where there were trees. So oftentimes if you're traveling through a park or whatever and you see a divot where there used to be a tree that's been taken out, you'll oftentimes see, uh, you know, um, flowerings of uh, Desarmillaria, Desarmillaria cespitosa. Uh, so, you know, they do cluster. This is a pretty uh, distinctive feature for them. The, uh, you know, stems themselves are uh, fairly uh, sort of fibrous, but also a little bit on the tough side. Uh, the gills of the mushroom, you can see, are, uh, you know, basically attached to the stem. As the mushroom matures, they will usually start to run down the stem. But in the case of these, uh, you know, younger specimens, there's just basically an attachment. The uh, mushroom's gills are sort of a beige tan. Uh, as the mushroom, uh, you know, matures, uh, you will oftentimes see sort of brown purpley staining. Right around that brown purple moment is also when these mushrooms start to smell like gym socks. So, you know, having survived, uh, having an older brother uh, through my adolescence, that's usually the point at which the memories evoked by the smell of Ar Desarmillaria um, cespitosa really turns me off and I no longer consider them from uh, an edibility perspective. So, um, you know, in addition to that, you will see uh, occasionally like a little hairiness on the, the top of the cap. As the mushrooms mature, they can get quite large and they get quite hairy. So you have this sort of, you know, um, off brown color and you'll see these black hairs um, start to uh, form. Additionally, and this is not a super uh, obvious feature on this collection, but the base of the mushroom stems tend to get darker than the uh, upper portion. So you have a white uh, stem that will often start to turn brown as the mushroom ages, this brown cap with the black fibrils, uh, and then, you know, sort of these uh, pale and then turning uh, brown and then staining brown purple as they age. Uh, so, you know, in addition to that, you do have uh, some discol discoloration and sort of darker coloration at the base. Uh, these mushrooms are really, really easy also to harvest because typically you can just pop them right uh, out of the ground. Uh, from a perspective of like, you know, environmental health and ecology, this is a parasitic species. And so they will attack uh, ailing trees, they will attack healthy trees, and also places where, um, you know, trees and plants used to reside. On my own, um, you know, I'm in my backyard right now. I have about a half an acre and uh, this fungus has taken up residence on uh, a willow tree. And I think that it killed it. It was, um, you know, doing reasonably well. Uh, but then, you know, two or three years after I started to notice these mushrooms popping up, the willow died. Uh, but, you know, you'll, you'll oftentimes see them in, uh, the long and short is distressed habitats. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons that you'll so frequently see them uh, and people will inquire about them. Like mushrooms are oftentimes a little more uh, sneaky than Desarmillaria tabesa or Desarmillaria cespitosa uh, because it just explodes like a bomb at the end of uh, August and early September. And all of a sudden, you know, people who are mushroom blind, most 
most of the year. Like, I have 10 pounds of mushrooms clustering on my front yard. Am I going to die? And the answer is no. Hopefully your trees won't die. And that's the real thing to be concerned with. Um, you know, on the subject of name changes, I just want to talk about this a little bit because, you know, when I got into mushrooming, um, I realized that after I learned about 20 species, I really needed categories for my knowledge. And so I went from learning just the common names of things that were, you know, reasonably manageable uh, to the Latin names. And the reason for that explicitly was because I needed to be able to organize and categorize my knowledge. And so that's super helpful. And from an, you know, like a, an ID approach perspective, I try to learn to genus. Uh, so if I'm out in the field and I can recognize a mushroom to its genus or even a larger family, um, like the bolete type mushrooms that all have a spongy undersurface, I learn to identify these very large groupings of mushrooms so that in the field I can kind of recognize them and then I collect them or take good pictures, bring them home to identify down to species. So there's a couple of reasons for doing this. One, there's a, just a shit ton of mushroom species and it's impossible to remember all of them. Secondarily, um, you know, you have a lot of species name changes and new species emerging. So, you know, in this case, there's been, um, you know, rumblings and talk of the ringless honey mushroom being, um, you know, split apart into European and a North American species for quite some time. And again, the reason for that is that, you know, we discover these uh, cases where things that we thought were one species end up being five or 10. And so, you know, when I can get something to genus, then I get home, I start to research it, and I can validate, you know, the current name if I care enough, uh, but at least get to a place where I can kind of understand where the mushroom exists in the overall land of fruiting bodies. That said, I'm not super rigorous. You know, I don't do um, microscopy regularly. A lot of people do. I typically don't take a lot of spore prints uh, just because I have a lot of familiarity with the different fruiting forms. And so my identification more relies on identification books and a lot of observations on the internet. And then, you know, going to reputable sources and validating the current scientific name. Again, if I'm so inclined to do so. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things that either you can become accustomed to or not. I uh, have a mushroom here that I absolutely love. It's uh, the rose tinted amanita. And it's just this gorgeous mushroom, you know. I, I, here's one that's even better. It has this, uh, you know, frilly and beautiful flanged uh, ring on the stem and sort of pinky gills. It has this nice cuffed, uh, you know, sack of tissue at the base with a little bit of, uh, you know, dusting of uh, sort of peachy colored uh, universal veil tissue. It's a beautiful mushroom. And, you know, if I were to identify it, there's probably two main names that I could use, Amanita comarkensis or Amanita rosiae tincta. Now, in the case of, like, if this didn't live in my backyard, I wouldn't bother to learn and retain both names. But in the case of a mushroom that I really want to be familiar with and that... <laughs> essentially I rely, uh, you know, uh, cohabitate with and uh, coming from a fungus that is probably the size of a horse or at least a good sized goat, I find um, being able to get really specific on the scientific name to be rewarding. But I don't by any means uh, think that is necessary in every case. Again, there are certain uh, species that I'm just sort of taken with and I spend a lot of time with. And so, you know, over time that curiosity grows. Um, you know, and I think additionally, that's one of the things that I discovered about um, edible mushrooms because I started with foraging and looking for chanterelles in particular. And, um, you know, as time has gone on, I still love to forage and eat mushrooms, but I really love collecting and seeing the diversity of species. And so, you know, for me, even though the uh, name changes can be a little bit daunting, they're just a matter of repetition. You know, every time you forget a name, it is easier to remember it the next time round. That is a, a comfort to me, especially because Latin and Greek and scientific naming conventions are not exactly uh, consistent or easy, all that fun stuff about dead languages. Um, but, you know, it allows me to understand these, uh, the relationship between people and their knowledge of an organism and how it has evolved over time. And that kind of is a, it helps balance the, uh, you know, the, the power and the relationship a little bit. Because I'm like, this is an organism we have made a lot of efforts to describe and we still don't fully understand yet. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, that um, 
exploration and, and development of a relationship with something I find to be one of the fabulous things about mycology. So um, that's all I particularly have to say. I guess the only other thing, actually, I did want to tell you about um, one other tactic for mushroom identification. Besides getting to genus, which I think is super helpful, uh, you also, I want to get you familiar with species groups, because you'll see this a lot if you're not familiar. Uh, someone will say, hey, that's um, Amanita jacksonii. It's a very common, very popular edible mushroom. And uh, you may see someone reply, oh no, that is the Amanita caesarei uh, section. Now, species sections are just basically a broken down, you know, kind of uh, morphologically and genetically similar subgrouping of a genus that isn't a specific subgenus. Um, so a lot of times though, when we see mushroom species get broken up, we'll go with something simple. So this is a good example. This is uh, uh, Russula in the Fetid group or Fetoides group. Uh, so, you know, initially there was an understanding that there was only one uh, Fetid Russula. As time went on, we discovered that there were multiple ones and there's, you know, again, now a species group, which is just sort of a generic way of referring to a group of species that many of them are unnamed. And uh, that is particularly helpful when you're trying to get specific, but you also want to uh, be mindful of the fact that you could have something that actually is not described by science and that's where also fun synonyms come in and some people saying, you know, sensu latu, which means in the broad sense. It can get a little arcane, but the long and short of it is it's changing all the time. Our names are changing all the time simply because we're trying to better articulate a system of knowledge that captures the uh, genetic heritage of these organisms. And then, you know, really we have certain limitations in uh, the ways that we can describe them because we don't know them all. So we turn them into sections and groups. When we get a little more formal, it becomes a subgenus. When it becomes super formal and we have, you know, a demonstrated uh, microscopic and a phylogenetic difference, all of a sudden you end up with something that is no longer the ringless honey mushroom Armillaria tibescens, but is the edible and extremely common Desarmillaria cespitosa, the North American uh, partial to southeastern U.S. ringless honey mushroom. I hope you have a good afternoon or whatever time of day it happens to be for you and that you find lots of mushrooms and enjoy your interactions with them.